a good amount in adult health one, especially anatomy and physiology. I'm just going to fly through that part of it because you should know this. I ain't reading all that. Y'all can read the objectives. What makes up the upper airway? No. Nasal cavity. What is what is right there underneath your epiglottis? Your vocal cords, right? So your larynx, that's your vocal cords. Your pharynx is the back of your throat. You ever heard, oh, you got pharyngitis? That's where the infection is. Lower respiratory tract begins where? At the bottom of the vocal cords and down. So what comprises the lower airway? Trachea. <laughs> Bronchi, left and right. What does it go to then? Bronchioles. And then what is the terminal ending for the respiratory? Alveoli. And that is where all the magic happens. You've got to get air in and out, but that's where the um, exchange happens. How many lungs does your right... Y'all thought I just did. I was turning to make sure I was doing this. How many lungs does your right side have? Three. Lobes. <laughs> Y'all threw the short end of the stick by having this, or you might think it's funny when you threw the, the good end of the stick. Uh, three. <laughs> I'm not testing you on that. That is rope knowledge. I ain't gonna ask you how many loads does the right side of the lung have? We have kind of talked about this before, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit more on Monday. What is ventilation? That's the moving in and air of out. <laughs> Beer tender, I need another bar. Um, it is the physical movement of air. We don't respirate patients, we do what? Ventilate. Now, if you ever heard some old folks talking about the respirator, they're talking about the ventilator. Um, but what is respiration? It is the gas exchange, and it happens by diffusion. So this is the alveoli, this is the capillary bed. Oxygen, hopefully, comes across, carbon dioxide goes out, lines up back at the lungs, and you breathe out the carbon dioxide. Sometimes there's things I just don't think about with all of you that you don't know until I ask you to put on a non-rebreather. And you just go hook it up. And I'm like, they might not have ever taught you to put your little piggies in there on that little flutter valve to inflate the bag. Guys, I'm, I'm not making fun of you at all. This is our failure. Because you need to know that stuff. If you don't know how to inflate that bag, you need to go up to your clinical instructor and say, can you show me this? And you can do it as a group. <laughs> Nasal cannula. What's the most liters per minute you're supposed to set it to? Six. Six. You will blow their eyes out. So it should get you somewhere between 25 and 45% FiO2. What's in the ambient air? 21. Non-rebreather is what? 60 to 100. What is the minimum liters per minute that you use for a non-rebreather? It has to be 10 or that bag's not going to stay inflated. Um, so somebody asked last time, well, Ms. Horton, how do you decide whether you need to put it on 10 or 15? How do I decide? Kind of sick, low sick. Bad sick. I can't breathe a little bit. I really can't breathe. Do I just base it on SpO2? No. That SpO2 is a tool that we use in our arsenal. It does not define how bad their shortness of breath is. Um, the Venturi mask, you may or may not see. I'm, I'm telling you right now, you ain't see it in the ER unless they're being held there waiting on a bed. Um, 
And usually it's respiratory. Guys, y'all can do that. They'll tell you, hey, look at the venturi mask and put the little blue one in there. If you look on the little blue one, it'll say this much percentage FiO2. Um, it is very accurate, but it's not an emergency thing. What is pleurisy? Let's do some anatomy. What are the membranes that line the lungs <coughs> and the um, pleural cavity? Visceral and what? What does the word viscera mean? Your organs. Like if you're an evisceration, it means you've got a cut and what? Your guts are out. Your viscera are your organs. So the visceral pleura is around what? The organ. Your parietal um, membrane is where? It lines the cavity. This is an infection where? Somewhere in there. Um, what do I mean when I say it's reproducible? Right. Hey, doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do this. Don't do that. Right? Something that I ask you to do creates pain. When do they usually create pain? When I ask them to do what? Take a deep breath. If you're having a heart attack, does that pain change at all on inspiration? No, it does not. Um, what does quality of pain mean to you? What does it feel like? So this is your OPQRST, T, right? Onset, duration. duration. The Q is quality. What does it feel like? And what are the words we'll start throwing out? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it pressure? Is it aching, throbbing? How are they going to describe this? A very sharp, stabbing pain. This is not a dull pain and I don't have an elephant sitting on my chest. I don't know why it's not a hippo, a buffalo. It is always this dadgum elephant. And I guarantee you, if they say that, it needs to get your attention. As soon as they sweaty, left arm pain, somebody run and get the EKG. It's worse on inspiration. Now, might they have difficulty breathing? It hurts. What kind of assessment are we going to do? Vital signs. You're going to listen. If you ever hear a plural friction rub, it sounds like y'all go home and get two pieces of sandpaper and rub it together. Yeah, it makes your hair stand up when you hear it. It is so coarse when it doesn't sound like anything else. There is no mistaking. You might not know what that is, but it, there's no mistake. It ain't wheezing, it ain't crackles, it ain't rock high. We don't even use that anymore. It's not, sure as hell, not Strider. There's something. If you don't know what it is, go get somebody. Um, if it's bad enough, we might do ABGs. How do we treat it? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. They told us we're not supposed to use SOB no more. We ain't supposed to call nobody no SOB. And I have problems with that because I keep, I'm serious. They said, no, y'all don't use that. That's ugly. I'm like, you know who you're talking to. Anyway, I'm sorry, shortness of air. <laughs> Did you expect me to be appropriate? <laughs> Not to say the same. Um, <laughs> to read the underlying cause. Girl, I'm audio recording this. Dr. Will will kill you. What causes this? Infection. <laughs> So, what can cause an infection? Viral, bacterial. If it's bacterial, do you give? Yes. If it's viral, do you? No. You might give antivirals. Um, how do I know if it's bacterial? Very first, it's a lab test. It makes your white blood cell count go up. Virus does not. 
And, and guys, that's not testable. That's just for your knowledge. So antibiotics for bacteria, you have to treat the cause or it's not going to go away. Um, I don't even... I guess if you had COVID and they've got all the new antivirals, you are treating the cause if you've got a pneumonia associated with it. They need something for pain. What is Thoris and Thesis? I'm going to do what? I'm going to get you to bend over that table like this, and we're going to stick a great big needle in there, but we're going to have what looking in there? The doctor's going to have an ultrasound so he can see where that fluid is. Because you just don't want to... Um, what is that old game? Can it tell on the donkey? No, we're not doing that. Um, when I do this, what am I going to do with the fluid? You're going to send it to the lab. They're probably going to culture it and see. And then if they get specific bacteria, Pacific, then what can we do with our meds? Tailor that antibiotic. Now, if they come in and their white blood cell count is 567,051, um, what kind of antibiotics are they going to get on right immediately? What are they? There's two of them. Vancomycin, we're talking about IV. Piperacillin, Zosin. What's the rest of that? Piperacillin, Bact there you go. Piperacillin, Tazobactrim. Those are, that, that's the big gun, and Mirapenem is another one. But you're going to see Vank, you're going to see Zosin. But we don't want to keep them on that. Why? That's what creates all this bad stuff with bacteria floating around, like the super souped up versions. What test are we going to run? Check. Why am I doing an EKG? If it's not an ARC? I don't want this to bite me in my butt, right? Because they're going to say, what? I'm having <coughs> chest pain. You're not just going to say, it's pleasant. You can if you want to. And then you do the EKG. Ooh, my. Pleurisy is kind of a diagnosis of, it starts with an E. Exclusion. They're not having a heart attack. That's a big one. They're not having a PE. That's a big one. I go all through these things that's going to kill you, and it ain't none of them. Pleurisy. Um, now, if you do an EKG on somebody that has this, do you know what it's going to show? And it won't be as bad as an MI. And this does not happen with a myocardial infarction. You'll have ST segment elevation in every lead. That does not happen. If it did, they'd be dead. Because that would mean everything is included. And it's not as elevated as an MI. It does not meet the criteria but it gets your attention because it's elevated everywhere because of the inflammation. Your heart's not dying, your lungs are angry, and it's got that big inflammatory response. APGs, maybe, I think I talked about this last time, this is a very specific CAT scan. Angiogram, what am I looking for in the lungs? A PE. Like I said, I'm just doing that to rule that out, right? Because with a PE, you'll have chest pain, dry cough, and I can't remember the other one. There's one more. What is this? Uh huh? What'd you say? Well, it is. But what's causing that white? fluid, now what might that be? Might be blood, might be serous, might be sanguiceros, or it might be what? Purulus. And what is that called? It is an infection, but it's a pleural infusion that's purulent. It starts with an E. Empyema. That's very specific for that um, effusion is pus and when they draw that off you can't miss it because it's like um, y'all ever been around when they cut an abscess and all that nasty yeah it's being drawn out of that needle yeah it's, it's yeah that's it right there
What causes it? What kind of heart failure? Left side, where is it backing up to? The lungs. TB, pneumonia. Now, the pneumonia especially might be curing on pulmonary infections. What about this? What is that? Lung cancer. Guys, lung cancers do strange things. And they actually have like, they'll have their own metabolism, they'll make their own fluid, and all of a sudden the person is drowning and they didn't even know they had cancer. Um, and especially if they do have lung cancer and they're getting uh, chemo and radiation, which predisposes them to what? Infection. An infection. Now they have pneumonia. Now they don't have an immune system, so this is going to develop quickly. Are they going to have every one of these? No. Uh, fever, chills. So this is what we said, the quality, and they call that pleuritic pain. That's that sharp stabbing. And I've never heard them say this, that this is different. If they say this is a ripping, tearing pain, somebody is ripping my chest out, you better hold on. What is happening? A triple A, and it's probably die. I have never heard anybody describe it that way. It's sharp. It's stabbing. It, 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 it's, it's dull. It's pressure. It's the elephant ripping. It, somebody is ripping my chest apart. If y'all hear that, you better be highly suspicious that your patient is fixing to go in the toilet. <laughs> Why a tracheal deviation? It's built up so much that it's collapsed along and you can't breathe and you're getting more and more fluid and what is it going to start doing? Pushing against wherever, like if the fluid's over here, which way is it going to push? That way. And if I push and push and push, what happens to your heart and gray vessels? They can't pump at all. Your cardiac output goes to nothing. Your blood pressure goes to nothing. So you, now, this is not always, but you go in this morning and you knew they had a bad um, pleural effusion and you kind of had treated it and they were kind of decreased. You come back an hour later, respiratory rate has gone up to 40, um, cyanotic, diaphoretic, cool clammy skin, um, and now they're absent. What has happened? You have developed what? Attention pneumo. What kind of assessment are we going to do? Blood pressure, SpO2, um, the whole gamut like normal. A lot of these are the same. Um, sometimes you just throw in the extra stuff. Um, chest x-ray, chest CT, thoracentesis, send the fluid sample to the lab. Treat the cause. They might get a chest tube. They might get thoracentesis. What is a pleural catheter? Does anybody know? Huh? And now a chest tube, a chest tube has a very specific place it has to go. It's either, if it's emergent, it either has to go here, fifth and sixth, or second and third. That's it. <clears throat> These can be wherever the fluid is. Can they go home with them? Yes. Um, what is the risk if they go home with it? Because does everybody know how to drain that? And who's, whose problem is that? You have to give education. Guys, every, everybody's not in the medical field, and them going home with this is terrifying. You've got some great big tube hanging out their back and is leaking all this fluid out, and they're already sick because they have cancer. This is what it looks like. What does that look like? A JP drain, you do it the exact same way. Um, if they were in the hospital with that, and you go in there to drain it, what are you going to do with that fluid? We've already sent it to the lab. Measure it. Measure it. I need to know. 
that is in output. Because if you go in there and it's 15 and I go in there and it's about to burst, is that good or bad? That's not what we want to see. I want to see that go away. And we can pull this, right? I don't want to go in the wrong direction. I will be honest. I have never seen one of these. But in my mind, it's mine, no pun intended. It's the same as a EVD, I mean a, a ventricular shunt that's pulling the, CH, the CSF. Where does it go? Into the stomach. You got too much cerebral spinal fluid up here, which can make you have increased intracranial pressure and die. So I need to get rid of it, so I drop it in the stomach and the body re, uh, reabsorbs it. Um, this is the same thing. Fluoro, it's dumping it down there to be reabsorbed by the body. Now, one of the students asked a really great question, and I don't know the answer 100%, but I would think, what if it's an empyema? Are we going to do that? I don't want to put pus down in there. So I don't think I need to look that up, but I'm about 99.999% sure I'm not going to drop pus anywhere. I want it out of the body. How do you position a patient for thoracentesis in a perfect world? I'm going to get that um, the bedside table. Now, guys, if these people, how sick are most of these cancer patients that have this problem? Where do you need to be? Right close, because they're going to come up and get dizzy. Now they got a laceration, an arterial bleed, ain't nobody got time for that. It's all that paperwork. Uh, <laughs> bent over, they're going to come in with an ultrasound, and depending on where it is, they will put the catheter in. This is important. Why? And especially when I insert it, I want to know what? How much comes out, right? Who's in there? Brindle, you were there when we put that foley in that woman. How much came out? Uh, seven, 1,700? And then they say what? Go in there and clamp it. Why? You're going to put them in hypovolemic shock. You can't just... Go in there, and usually about a liter is the cutoff. It's the same thing with a hemothorax. And I know that, and a student asked me a really good question earlier. Well, it's just, it's still there. It's just not in the vascular. I said, I know, but it belongs in there. <laughs> um, so you can't just drain all of it out. So, but I've got to get that pressure down. And then we're going to try to go to surgery to figure out why we're still bleeding. You can't just not drain it. They're going to die. So drain it. If it starts getting above a liter, you're going to have to clamp it. Now, clamping it does what? In the interthoracic pressure, it increases it. So you might have to do what every now and then? Go in there and unclamp it. But you can't, you can't not drain the pressure or the blood. Um, it's painful and cancer patients there's something specific about that what's their tolerance it's high um, especially for bone cancer cancer of the bone is supposedly the most you can't control it you can't even get close to it um, so don't be judgmental. You ain't walked a mile in their shoes. <coughs> um, and I know nobody likes this thing. If they won't do the incentive spirometer, what are you going to tell them to do? Cough, turn, deep breathe. Guys, if they don't do this stuff, they're going to develop what? Pneumonia. <coughs> Um, if they don't do that, then at least get them to what? Sit up in the chair, stand up periodically. You have got to stop that because um, everything that sits still long enough grows moss. That's clots, that's in the lungs. So if you just sat there all day like, like a stagnant pond, you're going to grow some moss in your lungs. You need to give the patients education. If they're going home with that catheter, you need to tell them how to 
drain it, and change the tegaderm without creating an infection. This is an empyema, can be bacterial. Um, if it is, then we will give them antibiotics. Any of the um, fluid pus that we get from there initially has to be sent um, to the lab. All right, pulmonary edema. Y'all all have heard of pulmonary edema. We talked about it. Congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema. What sign of symptoms do you have from that? <coughs> they might be in a tripod condition. <coughs> Shortness of breath, clammy. What's coming out? Pink, frothy. It might not be pink. White or pink? Which one's worse? Pink. pink. This is still pulmonary edema, but it's got another word. This is not related to their heart. This has to do with their lung. Non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. There's another word for this that kind of sets it into perspective. It is called what pulmonary edema? Flat, right now. And this can develop over less than a minute. Believe me, they're sitting there, they're kind of sick, kind of short of breath, and all of a sudden this stuff just starts flowing out of their mouth. So we're gonna intubate them, right? We had to right then, in the back of the ambulance, the second we laid them down and gave them those meds, they went into cardiac arrest. Why? They're drowning. They're drowning. They were. Unstable, stable. Highly unstable. Have they had an insult to the system? And I'm telling you, this is not testable. I'm telling you this for your knowledge. This is important. Because y'all are going to be in the ER, you're going to be in the ICU where they're intubating patients. I need you to be aware. Insult to the system? Which nervous system is in play? Fight or flight, right? Heart rate's up, respiratory rate's up. My body is trying to fight to stay alive. I'm going to give you a sedative, a paralytic, a narcotic, and more sedative. I just got rid of your sympathetic nervous system, which was keeping you alive. The number one time your patient's going to code that's unstable is the second you give them those meds. Can you just not give them those meds? No, you're going to have a paralyzed patient that you're creating really bad pain in that is aware. That is the definition of torture. Especially if they die in the CT. Um, what is all this? Y'all caught that, didn't you? They got a rapid heartbeat. They're anxious, they're restless, cold, crammy skin. They're going into shock. At this point, do I care what kind? No. It's probably hypovolemic. It ain't got nothing to do with their heart. I don't care what kind. If they're hypotensive, you give them a vasopressor. If you see something in one of the diagnostics, if, if you see a white count that's through the roof, you're going to give them antibiotics. At this second, the patient is dying. I'm going to treat it real quick, and then we'll figure out specifics in a minute. What kind of breath sounds? Crackles, and it can be so bad, I'm standing right here, and I hear them. Like, it sounds like you could take their lungs and wring them out. Can you breathe through water? If you can, you're talented. No. What doesn't perfuse through water? Oxygen, nor carbon dioxide. Aerobic, anaerobic. Lactic acid, potassium. What are we doing? You're going into shock. How do you treat it? Oh, uh, always. Am I going to put them on nasal cannula? Absolutely not. Non-rebreather, and if they have an altered level of consciousness, I might not even do that. I might jump to what? I'm going to get that ambu bag off. Now, might they fight you if they're not unresponsive enough? 
Guys, can you imagine having trying to sit there and let me force 800 milliliters of air, don't put that much, <laughs> down in your lungs? They're going to fight you unless they're just altered enough. But you still need to try. A non rebreather is not even enough. Their O2 sat 70, and they're dang near unresponsive. You're going to need to jump to something a little bit more aggressive. Yes, ma'am. You would use a CPAP if you had it readily available. That's something else that's in our arsenal. But there again, if they have never had a CPAP on and they're not used to it, and y'all know this is the, it looks like an octopus is on your face, right? Um, are they going to tolerate that? Probably not. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm going to give them something first. Now, I'm not going to give them a full dose of sedatives because that might knock out that, but you might have to sedate them a little bit. Especially, because folks that sleep in it all the time, I don't think I would ever get used to that, but you might get a little bit used to it. If you have never, my preceptor at Life Flight, he said, Shayla, I'm gonna put this on you so that you know what it feels like, y'all. I was okay until he pulled them straps down and then it's shoving that I snatched it off and threw it across. I said, ah, nope, can't do it. Can't do it. I, I could not, like I went into plus four panic. It is not, it is not a natural feeling to have air shoved down your uh, lungs. So they may fight you a little bit. If you walk in and you don't really know what's wrong and the patient is struggling to breathe, what do you need to do? <laughs> Elevate, guys, I don't need to ask anybody. I've got standing orders. Elevate the head of the bed. Especially if they're laying down flat. They're not gonna let you lay them down flat, are they? They gonna come up fighting if they got enough um, still left up there to lay down. What kind of meds? Vasodilators, maybe what, to draw some of the fluid off. Diuretics. Diuretics, um, Lasix probably. What test? <laughs> Chest x-ray, CT, and I didn't put it up here, but why would I do a CTA? Make sure they don't have a PE that's causing this. I'm not going into this. Wow. I'm not going into this a lot. What is pulmonary hyper? What's hypertension? High blood pressure. This is high pressure in what? The lungs. Um, what does dyspnea exertion mean? What What is the statement they're going to tell you? I can't even walk to the mailbox. I know we hear that all the time. <laughs> Now they got to live out in the country for that. Um, or I can't even walk across the room without struggling to breathe. Um, might they have chest pain? Yes. Um, here again, when you treat it, oxygen. Whose position of comfort? Not mine. Theirs. If they say, I have to stand on my head to breathe, then guess what you're going to be doing? We're going to help you into that headstand. Because the thing is, guys, if, if that truly is helping them breathe, who are you to say, that's not right? I had a patient transport on the fixed wing. He said, I really just need to sit up. Can I sit beside you? He was just stable enough, but he could not breathe. And he's panicked. Why wouldn't I let him sit there? Now, you, you unresponsive and you got an easy tube. That's kind of hard. Um, what meds are made specifically for pulmonary hypertension? What? Maybe. This treats it specifically. It's the little blue pill. Uh, a phosphodiesterase 
inhibitor. I think I told y'all that story about them yelling at my patient for the little blue pill. He said there wasn't nothing wrong with his jaw. Why are you giving it? That's why it was made. Pulmonary hypertension in NICU babies, and they noticed a very strange side effect. It causes venous dilation, right? That's what I want, and it affects the lungs. What test? Chest x-ray, CT, what is this? Pulmonary function test. That might not be now, it might be like on down the road. That is not an emergent um, diagnostic. EKG, what about this one? Why am I doing an echo? Which one is affected if it's failed? Right or left? Right. Why? Um, if I've got pulmonary hypertension, how well is the right ventricle going to get the blood through there? What's your cardiac output? What's your perfusion status? You're going to go into shock. I know y'all talked about lung cancer maybe a little bit in um, adult health one. There are specialized places you work. There are two that I can think of that are the most, besides, we're not talking about peace. The cancer floor and the burn ICU. There's things you do in there you will never do anywhere else. There's medications up on the, the floor that they have the cancer patients that literally, they're chemo drugs. You have to go to this two week long class to even get certified. So when I get this patient, the first day I'm off orientation, guess who I called? I was like, can y'all please send a nurse down here because I, I'm not trained on these meds. The patient had something else going on besides the cancer. That's why they're in the MICU. What causes it? A vast percentage. Do not worry about small cell non how do we treat it? Usually it's radiation, chemo, um, maybe surgery, maybe immunotherapy. Guys, but there might not be anything to do. But that doesn't mean this isn't just as important, right? Because palliative care lets the patient do what? Comfort and die with dignity. Their family might not even be up there. Can you imagine dying alone? Can we just reach in there and grab that cancer and jerk it out? At least we could. You kind of have to treat the fallout, right? If they've got dyspnea, fatigue, Knowledge of vomiting, then we give them an uh, anti-emetic. If they've got anorexia, then we try to help them eat. Um, what about this? If they tell you, oh my God, I'm so tired in the morning. You probably don't sleep well to begin with. So. How are you going to tailor your nursing care? Cluster it. If you can, cluster it. Don't go in there, hey, I got something for you. Come out. Hey, I got something for you and you come out. They're gonna be asleep on the floor by the time you come back in there the next time. Cluster your care, and if they say, now sometimes you can't do this. Oh my God, I'm so tired in the morning. Do everything what? In the afternoon. This is not hard things. If you can't do it, you can't do it. But if you can, then why aren't you doing it? I don't have time. The hell with that. You do have time. You're not making the effort to get organized, right? So if I have opened your chest cavity and pulled a big wedge of your lung out, what does that predispose you to? Infection. What might they develop when you close the chest back? Yes, they might develop a pneumothorax if something, like let's say that they nick something and you start bleeding in the chest cavity. It's still a hemothorax. Yes, ma'am. That one. 
So a wedge, a segment, a lobe, are basically the whole what? The whole. No, they just take it out. If you have cancer, are you going to get a lung transplant? Nope. I'm telling you right now, you won't. Um, God could move you up to the top of the list and you're not getting it. Um, can they remove both? Can they remove both? No. Um, guys, they got to stay in the ICU for at least a day or two. That ain't a little... We don't cut this off. No. We got to stay for a minute. What are we going to do before pre-op? You got to do all the tests. I got to do an x-ray. Why would I do an EKG before that surgery? I need a baseline, but I need to make sure what? Your heart is healthy enough for us to do this. All your baseline labs, you know, we're going to try to get them to stop smoking. But you might get cussed out. And that's okay, you try. But don't go in there and try to beat them over. If they said they ain't gonna quit smoking and they got lung cancer, what damn difference are you gonna make? You gotta quit smoking right now because it's gonna make you live one day longer. One day longer miserable. Let them smoke everything they want if they got two weeks to live. Give me a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> are that sick, but can you just not do it? Unless they have said what? No. Do not. Um, if we're doing, if there's a chest tube in place and that first output, how important is that? Extremely. I'm not saying the other ones don't matter, but I need to know how much it got out initially and then an hour or 30 minutes, then an hour, then two hours, then four hours. What am I looking at? Trends. Trends. If I'm getting a hellacious amount more, this is not the direction I want to go. If it's dropping, thumbs up. What type chest trauma? And I know it's up there. Blunt and penetrating. Does it have to be a knife? No. No. I forgot to pass these around. Got it. Don't, please don't stab, stab yourself. <laughs> don't stab her. Don't shank anybody. These are IV catheters. If you have seen every size, then just pass them along. And don't, um, don't engage the safety mechanism. Blunt penetrating. I think you go over blunt first. What causes blunt trauma? Falls. Falls. Car accidents. Car accidents. What kind of sports? Football. What else? Baseball. Rugby. Oh my God, rugby. And ain't nobody put soccer in it. Guys, they ain't got nothing on but socks and, and cleats. No pads. And like, uh-uh. They, they, and they brutal in that. Wrestling, man. Oh, yeah, right? 
So in a motor vehicle crash, what usually happens to cause that? Are they hit? How fast does an airbag come out? 300 miles per hour, and it's going to hit you in the chest. Now, it saved you, but I now have what? Blunt trauma. What can it cause? Chest wall fractures. Contusion. What's a contusion? It's a bruise. And lung injury. Usually what causes a lung injury? Either the blunt force trauma and the rib goes into the lung, or what? You got stabbed or something. What? Something else. Like you literally, because if you show up, if I was on the ambulance and I showed up and the steering wheel is bent up, or it's broken off, and it's got this little pointy thing, and it has gone in the patient's chest and out, it's still a penetrating trauma. Um, simple rib fractures. What do they look like? I've never had one, but they say it's extraordinarily painful, even if it's one. Pain? Why are they short of breath? How are they breathing? It hurts. <laughs> What's the crepitus? <laughs> so it's it it's two different things. It is the Rice Krispies, but that's air underneath the skin from this lung injury. It just kind of gets in here, and when you press on it, and your hair stands up, and you cringe. It literally feels like either Rice Krispies or the little um, bubble wrap, and it's underneath. You feel it, you will never forget it. And what did I just say? You feel it. You can't just stand across the room and say, yep, you got crazy. <laughs> if you are shy, you have got to get over it. I don't want to go in there and get folks naked and feel on them anyway, any more than anybody else does. This is your job. You've got to figure out how to get over that. Now, if it's a female that's in there and she's panicked because it's a male coming in there, you need to try to do what? See if you can get a female nurse. Does that always happen? You still have to do your job. But you can do things to make them more comfortable. You have to feel their chest. Do your lungs and ribs stop right here? No. So I'm going to have to palpate back here all the way down. Does this hurt? Does this hurt? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was funny. Uh, what am I looking? What am I feeling for? Crunching. Anything that ain't supposed to be. So we said the Rice Krispies. What is the other crepitus? And this, this is Miss Horton's thing. I can't do it. Yes, it is a. And if you're, if you're helping the doctor, sit, if you're holding the arm they're going to sit, and that is grating, oh. I about threw up right there. <laughs> I got to go. But you can, you can definitely feel it, and sometimes you can hear it. Um, but both of them are crepitous. It, I mean, even though it's your lungs, it might have a deformity if it's fractured bad enough. Vital signs, the same for all. You have to include palpation. And we're going to do what for vital signs? We're going to listen. Look. Look at their chest. Do what, what am I looking for? And it, Clothes on or clothes off? You can't look through their clothes. You have to take them off. Here again, any female, you need to do what if they've got one on? You've got to take that bra off. It ain't nothing personal. You can't see through it. You're going to get bit in the rear end if you don't look at something because you're shy.
your scapula. If you show up and this is broke, you better be looking for lots of food. I don't know, it's good, she's turning red. Um, I don't even know what I'm laughing. Um, if they got broken ribs, you need to be looking for A, B, C, D, E. You don't just, okay, I'm done. Don't look anywhere below that. X-ray, EKG, and maybe even an APG if they're breathing bad enough. Is this the same thing as a simple rib fracture? No. no. This can be awful. That is a real bad day. Um, what is a flail chest? At least two or more ribs broken in what? Two or more places. So if this is broken, you have this actual free flailing about segment, right? <coughs> so when I breathe in, what does that segment do? This is National Registry. No, good God. <laughs> and I said that earlier too, and nobody caught that. This is NCLEX testable. Guys, that's the test that uh, paramedics take. I'm sorry. I told y'all my brain gets confused sometimes between talking to y'all and medics. Paradoxical movement. What does that mean? It's a seesaw. One goes in, another one goes out. One goes out, and, and you don't. Did y'all ever play with a seesaw on the kids yeah. and they were mean and ugly yeah. and so then they sat down there and made you stay up? Alright, everybody look here. That's at least two, maybe three, and he has an open chest wound. That's bad. How much do you think his perfusion is? It is garbage. Because when we talked about shock, I said you have to have an intact what? Respiratory system. We ain't gonna get the perfusion. You ain't breathing right. I ain't worried about where the blood don't go to oxygen. I ain't got no oxygen. Right? <laughs> yeah, so that's bad. <laughs> That chest is highly unstable. <clears throat> Paradoxical mo movement. This is what they look like. Crepitus. And that guy, how bad do you think his shortness of breath was? Bad. Cyanosis. They ain't got no oxygen. Pain. Why this? Hold on. If I've got enough do you think that guy might have had a pneumo? Absolutely. If I've had enough force to have possibly three flail segments, something has shattered and gone into your lungs. You can bet on it. Even if not, that's enough of a blunt trauma to rupture everything in there, and you'll either have a hemo or you'll have a pneumothorax building that will turn into a tension. Yes, ma'am. It's just the ribs that's causing that um, paradoxical movement. But if this has happened, it has impacted what? The lungs. Vital signs, breath sound, like you didn't need to palpate that guy. I'm telling you, you still do need to do it, but you're going to walk in and say, oh my Lord. Um, if it's not that severe, you still, guys, you still have to do a palpation on, on a trauma patient. And you have to do it head to toe. What's up here? Airway, breathing, circulation. That's why we do it, a head to toe assessment. How do we treat these? Quickly. <laughs> uh, very quickly. Me and you from old school, um, when I first started on the ambulance, we would take a 500 milliliter saline bag and tape it down to that. Do you think that was a good idea? It wasn't. It actually made it worse. But um, 
EMS is not the greatest at evidence-based practice. Guys, we've only been around since 1973. That's the year I was born. Nursing has been around since Barney was a lizard. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting on her to take a drink so she spit it out. <laughs> but I mean, think about it. Nursing has been around for always, ever. And um, we, we ain't the best about evidence-based practice and, and a lot of the philosophy is, damn it, we done it this way all our life. We're going to keep doing it. Yeah, you're stupid. Um, then we changed to the bulky dressing. And honestly, it's saying that it doesn't really do any harm, but it doesn't really do any good. Um, what? Oh, nothing. Um, so is the chest unstable? It is. If it's that, that guy is going to have to go to the OR and they're going to open his chest up and they're going to put all these plates and screws and I don't I guess that stays forever because everything is broke so they have to stabilize the thoracic cavity to allow them to breathe again it is I mean I've seen pictures I've never I, I've never worked in the OR I don't know um, might need a chest tube Probably gonna need some pain control. We're gonna do a chest X-ray, CT. Why am I gonna do an ABG? What might I have to do with what kind of airway? An advanced airway. What are the advanced airways? I know endotracheal too. What else? LMAs. King airways. Um, you use the adjuncts, uh, uh, OPA and NPA. If their chest is that unstable, are they able to breathe right? You're going to have to sedate, paralyze, and intubate them and put them on the ventilator. What is important about that? It lets what rest? Your lungs. If you don't let the lungs rest, they're going to do what? Fail. Um, and here again, if they're that unstable, you might run the risk of them doing what when you intubate them? Going into cardiac arrest. And you just said assistantly, right? I said they're not going off the No, they're not going to come off the vent. But, um, because usually when people go into cardiac arrest, it's either V-fib, um, V-tac. A lot of times this is asystole. But you can't not do it. You just need to be aware that you need to have everything. Crash cart, they need to have the pads on. Um, somebody needs to be praying. Um, just saying. Um, so people might tell you this is not that bad. Maybe if it's this size. But what if it's this big? Can you have perfusion through a bruise? Nope. And so this patient's going to come in. They got thrown out um, of the car and they hit a tree. But there's not really anything wrong with them. But their SpO2 is 89 and they're healthy. You put them on a non rebreather, it doesn't come up. I turn it up, little balls quivering, it doesn't come up. What's wrong? They have a pulmonary contusion. Now, you're still going to do all the things. Yes? With small chests, are you still doing CPR? I don't think you would, would you? You would have to. If they go in the, guys, you have to, and that's going to be awful. Yes. Um, like, could you just do intervention with meds and if that doesn't work, then follow up? Unless they're, if they're not, if they're not. Ethan, it's like doing, it's like doing chest compressions on 80 year olds, just what it feels like. They said if you don't break the ribs, they're already broke. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm dead serious. Has anybody done CPR in here and ain't broke ribs? Exactly. On young people, guys, CPR is not pretty in any way, shape, form, or fashion. If I cannot have the family in there, I don't want you to see that. It's ugly. You're going to break ribs, and you're gonna, everybody's going to hear it. They might have chest pain, and it might get worse. They're still rapid, shallow breathing. Depending on how big that pulmonary 
contusion is, it might get a lot worse, and we still have to wind up doing what? Intubating them, ventilatory support, so that that lung can heal. If they have that bad of contusion, what do I need to look for? They might have something broken. So it's very important that you're palpating for a flail where you see it for them, or crap it somewhere. Oxygen. So if somebody comes in and it's not bad enough for intubation, but they stayed in the hospital for two or three days, what complication am I looking for? Pneumonia. They don't want to breathe deep. It hurts. They don't want to get up out of their bed and they want to stay like this. Anything that sit, any water that sits stagnant long enough grows moss. This is moss in their lungs, and moss does not belong in their lungs. Yes. Why on this one on the cable do you not have our nose? Is that not for that not being off the nose? No, I'm sorry. You're not as I would let it off there. Um, but the same thing, how do you prevent pneumonia from anything lung-wise? Movement. Movement, turn, cough, deep breathe, splinting. Because why don't we teach them to splint? That lets them turn, cough, and deep breathe and actually maybe get up and get vertical so that they're not laying down with those secretions pulling. Test here again, chest x-ray, CAT scan. All right, is it just knife wounds? No, it's anything that penetrates the chest cavity. Now, sometimes, that's a lot. That's huge. Uh, Y'all know what that is? It's rebar. I don't know how that happened. And this is just a metal rod. That's a bad day. Um, Huh? Yeah. Um, the worst one I've ever had, y'all know the fences with the little... Oh, yeah. So he was working, he was really working, and thank God he wasn't that far up. I don't know what would have happened. And he fell on it. And he's there on it when we got there, awake. Uh, and it had gone through and through. So we had to get the fire department to do what? cut and cut, because I ain't pulling it out. We ain't going to pull him off of it. Um, and we went to the hospital. I took three firefighters all holding that. He got to go to the OR to get that out. Mm -hmm. It ain't happening with me. What else, though? Gunshots. Why is the caliber important? Little B gun, 22, whether it's a rifle or a pistol, what happens to that bullet? It, it's like a, a pinball. And I don't want that award, right? <laughs> I, I don't want that bouncing around, just get out. Now, what if I've got a 30 out six and I shoot this gentleman in the back right here? Game over. His whole chest cavity is gone. Is it different with a shotgun? At the, yes. It's still gonna do a hell of a lot of damage but it's gonna be, it depends on how close you are and what caliber gun you have. What's the difference between a simple pneumothorax and a tension? It's building up tension. <laughs> it's breathed out. Um, it has built up enough that it's doing what? It's pushing. What is it pushing on? The heart and the great vessels. Why do they get hypotension? If I have pushed you all against this wall, what is my cardiac output? Nothing. What's your blood pressure? Nothing. Nothing and nothing equals nothing. <laughs> Are dead. I almost got you that <laughs> um, Where are the decreased breath sounds? On the side of the injury. Um, if it shifts all the way over, where are the absent breath sounds? 
both sides. I mean, if it gets that bad, but that's post mortem that you'll see that tracheal deviation. <laughs> If you have a closed tension pneumothorax, you have to do this immediately. I need what in that chest? I've got to have a hole. If that trachea has started shifting, you probably have less than five minutes before they die. And if it's already shifted a little bit, maybe less than two. We have to get a hole in that chest. Whether it's a needle, uh, I, ain't, I ain't gonna do no needle. We're gonna do a scalpel in one of these, which is banding clamps. I, mean, I don't know if they, and you see that these are huge. What'd you say? Um, it's more important that I get the hole. We'll put the chest tube in. This might be important for you to remember. Immediate decompression. We're going to put the chest tube. We're going to put them on oxygen. We're going to do all the things. If I don't make that hole and decompress the chest, they're going to die. This is like V-fib and D-fib. V-fib, immediately you defibrillate. There ain't no pause. There ain't no let's do this first. We need to treat whatever is causing it. And we need to do pain control. Is this up here? No. Nope. This has to come first. Now, what's the difference? It's open. So, what kind of trauma is usually your closed? Blunt trauma. Penetrating. So they're going to walk in the door. How do I know that they have a... What is the other name for it? <laughs> Sucking chest wound. Why do we call it that? Every time they breathe in, it, it almost sounds like a little bit of a whistling sound. But it also does what? It bubbles. Huh? Um, how do we treat this? There's... Um, Guys, I'm going to pass this around. Please don't take that piece off of it. Um, there are two types of chest seals. This is the Asherman and this is the hyphen. We'll start on this side. Um, why am I doing that? If I have a hole and it's bubbling out, every time they breathe in, what goes in their chest cavity? More air. Does it all get back out? No. Are they still breathing in? And if they have a hole in their lung, now they've got air leaking out the lung, air coming in from out here. How quickly do they develop that? Extraordinarily quickly. So if somebody walks through the doors of the emergency room and they have been stabbed in the chest and it's bubbling, what is the first thing you're going to do? It's, it's, right, it's right here. She looks like she's going to slap me for a minute. <laughs> if she is stabbed right here and the, the knife's out and it's bubbling, what's the first thing I'm going to do? And we're going to walk. Have gloves on. We're going to walk to the trauma room, and I'm not going to take my hand off. Nobody's going to take my place until we get that chest sealed. And then we're going to put that on there, right? Because if I've got gloves on, it seals it off a little bit. What is the difference between these two? That one has a flutter valve. If I completely cover this up and I have a hole in the lung, is there still air leaking out into the chest cavity? What's going to happen? 
you're going to create a tension pneumo. So if you start seeing those signs and symptoms, you need to do what? You need to take the corner up and let the pressure out, but you've got to recover it because then you're just going to have the same thing you had. But ultimately, they have to fix it, right? Um, chest x-ray. What labs will we draw? Uh, we're going to get a CMT. I might draw ABGs, it depends on how bad they're breathing. Um, so this is a pneumo, which P-M-E-U, chem means what? Air. Hemo means what? Blood. Can you have both? Absent for, is that a bad thing? Almost three liters. How much do males have floating around? About six females? About five. If I lose half of that, you're almost you're in what? What kind of um you're in hypothermic shock? Um severe dyspnea. Why why baby did And that's not just with the hemothorax. If everything has pushed, your blood, your um, cardiac output has gone to nothing, can your blood get in? It's like having right-sided heart failure. Where does the blood go? It can't get in, so it's going to go up to the superior vena cava and down to the epic. You're going to see it right here. If it gets down to here, they're dead. Mm -hmm. um, why do they have hypertension? Two reasons. They ain't got no perfusion, and their blood is leaking out of their chest cavity. So they've got hypovolemia, I can't breathe, no oxygen, it's a bad day. Vital sounds, of course. Breast sounds, palpation. I don't care about tactile primitives. 99. <laughs> Guys, when you first start, that is important. This is the only time you will hear me say to do percussion. If you on the helicopter, you in the ambulance, you're not going to you're not going to be able to do this right. If you're in the ER and I know it's never quiet, then you can do this. So if you just tap on your lungs, they're hollow organs, right? It sounds and feels different than if I tap on my liver. It's like this dull sound. If I tap up here, it's not like that. If I tap here and it's dull, what does it mean is in there? Blood or fluid. But in this case, it's multi-system trauma. I'm worried about blood. Now, if I listen, anybody ever been in the Grand Canyon? Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> this lung is down. Is there a lot more space in there? You will hear the term hyperresonance. So you're gonna hear breath sounds, but it's like, and you're not gonna have what? Breath sounds over here. But when you do the percussion on a hemothorax, it's a very um, dull sound, just like you would if you did it on a solid organ. Even with this, uh, sooner or later, you're going to see tracheal deviation. <laughs> yes. Because if enough blood builds up, it's going to increase the pressure and it's going to shift. So I need a chest tube. I need IV fluids because they might be going into what? Hypovolemic shock. Uh, pain control. And besides IV fluids, what else might I need? Blood products. Chest x-ray, lab. For this one, what other lab am I probably going to get the lab to come up and draw? 
type and screen. You can't just give them all fluids if they're dumping out two liters in their lungs. And I know this might sound a little bit counterintuitive. Well, Miss Horton, they're drowning. I'm gonna give. You can't just not replace the blood either. this. 